What's going on, kings and queens? It's your boy, Willis Blessing. Welcome to another episode of the Secret Sauce Podcast, the ingredients of the underdogs. Listen, y'all, I got a big treat for y'all today. Um, somebody who is definitely um, phenomenal at what they do, a beast at what they do, and they're going to come on here and um, he's just going to give you so much game in regards to how you can monetize as a speaker um, in the school districts. And so with no further ado, Dr. Joe, what's going on, man? What's going on, brother? How you doing? Man, I'm feeling, <clears throat> good, man. I'm feeling good. I'm always excited to talk about this uh, information. It's so important for entrepreneurs. So let's mm -hmm. get into it, brother. Let's get into it. So um, let's start from here. Uh I'm a new speaker, right? You know, um, what are the what are the what are the steps that I need to take as a new speaker to put me in a position to even be considered to get in paid? Okay, well, there's I, there's two answers. I'm gonna give them both at the same time. One, you have to be a vendor, right? You have to be a vendor. If you're not a vendor, they can't bring you in. Most times, uh, that's going to be the first thing they're going to ask you. And the process is not hard, but it's it's a slow process, especially if you're trying to get a turnaround with a quick contract. So the first thing I like to tell people is become a vendor. They usually ask you to fill out their vendor application, ask for your W-9, uh, your tax ID information, and a couple other things that most people already have on hand. But you just want to make sure you fill that process out. You want to do it for every district you want to partner with just so that you don't have that hold up when it's time to secure the contract. That's the easy part. The harder part is you got to make sure that you have a message that we want to buy. All right? mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that you know, as a school, um, what does our data say is important to us? You know, do we have a problem with our young people and the way that they're not reacclimating back into the school from after this COVID-19 pandemic? Do we have a problem with students who lack motivation? Are we have a, do we have a high suspension rate? Are our kids struggling academically? Um, you, you really want to kind of dial into the school's needs and offer them something that aligns with what, they, what they're looking for. And I think that's uh, probably the hardest thing for speakers because they oftentimes want to use a canned message and it may not be what we need. And even if we like you as a speaker, it just doesn't fit, you know, doesn't align with our, our school priorities. So that's something they got to do if you want to uh, get contracts with schools, you got to speak our language. Mm, wow. <laughs> hey, coming out firing just like that. Um, and so what would you say um, as it ties to like, I'm a speaker, right? I got a book. What can I do with my book as it relates to the schools? Can I, can I monetize my book? Is there a way to land speaking engagement? Can I increase my fee with the book as a speaker? Right. That's a great question. And, and you're, you're in a good position with a book, especially if it's a book that you think young people will want to read, or if it's a book that you think adults will want to read. Um, mm -hmm. most speakers do package themselves together with the book. You just got to remember that it comes off a different funding line item. So it comes off the, um, I think, books and other periodicals or instruction. It could, depending if it's um, a professional development book, it may come off that if that's for, um, for adults. But you want to negotiate that in your contract that if you bring me in, you would buy X number of copies of my book. And it's a way to get paid off of different line items. One thing I would tell, I tell entrepreneurs all the time is we have money. It's just, are you asking for money on the lines where the money is? All right. Mm -hmm. So we have money to, to buy whatever we want to buy in most cases. First of all, as long as you're approaching us early on in the process where we can allocate funding for what it is that you're trying to sell. And then you can always be able to slide in your fee on different ways. Uh, but your book should be a way to do that for sure. And it's something that's kind of standard for every speaker who does have a book. They want to sell copies or they want to make sure they put copies in the hands of the staff or the students. Now, let's go into, I'm, I'm a, I'm a well-established speaker, right? You know, I have the website, I got the book, right? I got, you know, a lot of video content out here. What is one way that as a speaker, like I'm like, you know, I'm trying to transition from speaking to kids and more so start speaking to the actual um, leaders in the school. What can we do to position ourselves as a as a professional development speaker? Making so give me give me one more one more piece of context. Give me an idea about what it is you, that you talk about, so I can help you answer that question. Got you. Let's say we talk about burnout. Okay. Yep. So if you talk about burnout, that's what you want to talk about with the staff. Then a couple of things I want to do. First of all, I want to make sure that you understand what it's like to teach in an urban environment, right? So you're talking about. Urban education is a whole different grind than rural education, suburban education. It is a, it's a different beast. And there is definitely a need for 
PD, that, that, that professional development that aligns with burnout. Then you want to start talking about making in your pitch that you are addressing the mental health of staff. And you want to use, you want to use buzzwords like reducing attrition. Uh, you want to improve the effectiveness of the staff. You, there, there are certain words that need to be in your pitch, uh, but we would definitely need something like that because the turnover rate for urban schools is so high uh, because it's just a tough group to work with. You know, they come in with so many issues off the bus into the building and the teachers have to deal with whatever, whatever, whatever they encounter for the day. So there is room for that. And I know that under the CARES Act, that there is a lot of um, push towards focusing on the mental health of staff. Mm -hmm. And um, they're doing things like meditation. They're doing things like um, a lot. There's a lot of mental health because you think the districts aren't equipped for everyone, especially in this post-COVID world, who has all of these employee assistance needs, they're not equipped for everybody to need help at the same time, all mm -hmm. right? They're, they're equipped to be able to work with teachers on a small scale, but what happens if the burnout, we're in a, we're in a high need school, a lot of at-risk kids, a lot of violent incidents happen, kids are very unmotivated, they don't really do well in their classes, and we're constantly being hit over the head with raise test scores, raise test scores, raise test scores. After a while, a lot of the staff members, they turn to alcohol, they turn to drugs, you would be amazed at what teachers deal with to cope with it. So uh, if you can add those things about uh, reducing attrition, because we don't want to lose staff, it's much harder to work with a new teacher than to try to help a veteran teacher. So those are things that I think can get you in the door and get principals to really consider your uh, your, your program to work with their staff. Mm. Y'all, man. I don't know. We may have to end this podcast early, man. You give it to <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Let's say um, I'm a speaker and I keep hearing not yet, not yet, not yet. What should I be doing? So we are, in a, we are a relationship built business. We are, you will land a contract much faster if you can form a relationship with a principal or a building leader, even if there is no money at the time that you're pitching your product resource service, your curriculum. Just understand that not yet literally means not yet. It mean, if we don't want to work with you, we're just going to tell you no. We don't work with you. We're just not going to return your email. We're not going to call you back. We're not going to want to sit down for a, with a meeting with you. But if you get to the point where we even talk to you, if you get to the point where we even want to sit down with you, we may say, hey, look, we don't have a, we don't have a money right now, but we would love to consider you in the future when we get additional funding. We understand, even though you may not understand, especially as it, like, as it relates to Title I funding, that we have times in the year we're able to do budget adjustments. We're able to move money from one line item where we didn't have money for you to that line item because we now realize, hey, we didn't plan on this in the beginning, but it's something we overlook. We really do need to focus in on that. And so because we told you not yet, you're on our list of people that once that budget adjustment period comes, we're going to move money to that line item. And when we call you, you need to be ready to move. When we call you and say, hey, look, we got money. We moved it to this line item. We want to bring you with we want to bring in with our kids. You need to be ready with the books. You need to be ready with your uh, presentation to be able to come in and work with our staff and our faculty. Because not yet means not yet. It doesn't mean no. So, I I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I should. I don't know if I should ask you this question. Go ahead, ask, brother. Go ahead. No, I don't know. I, I don't want to give him too much game, coach. So let's put it this way: Where is the money? The largest part of money is going to be now, and this is a tricky question because it's going to be with Title I schools if they are within their Title I budget, if they're a Title I school. But there are a lot of schools that don't receive Title I funding. Most mm -hmm. of your urban uh, in all your major metropolises are going to have Title I funds. They're going to have a big allocation. It is commensurate with the district's pot, and then they break it down with the school needs, school enrollment, all the rest of that. That's the big pot, but that's also usually going to be aligned to a core academic area like reading, language, arts, math, science, social studies, something in that ballpark. There are some districts that are now starting to consider things like PBIS, social and emotional learning with Title I funds, because the problem is so egregious in this post-COVID world. However, there is the other schools who don't get Title I funding that are, especially larger schools, have what's called FTE money or per pupil funding, which is we get a certain allocation based on the number of students who are continuously enrolled from the FTE count in October to March. Those students stay at that school. And there's some other factors that, that go into it, but that's the other large pot of money. If you are a speaker, usually that's the pot 
you are going to be targeting, as well as the principal's account, which is something you don't even, most people don't even know about. But every time they have vending machine sales in schools, all the kinds of fundraisers, the principals have a fund that they have total autonomy on how they want to spend it. It has fewer regulations than Title I. It has fewer regulations than FTE money. And many times that's the fund that they'll use the principal's account or even partners in ed who donate money to schools. Principals can use that money much more freely than they can with Title I or FTE money. So it's different pots depending on what the school is. Um, can, can, will definitely govern how they're going to pay. Mm. Let's keep this going. This is, this is good. This is good. Um, so let's say I'm reaching out to a principal, mm -hmm. right? What, what is the best way to reach out to them and how should that look like? The best way to reach out to the principal is don't just reach out to the principal. The mm -hmm. principal is probably the least likely person to call you back. They're the least likely, least likely person to return your email if you don't work in a school, you just don't understand what happens on a regular basis. And, you know, to quote the line from, from Richard III, heavy lies the head that wears the crown. So mm. if you are in charge, everything is on you. That is, they delegate. And so usually they delegate to a person like me. I'm the assistant principal in my building. I deal with Title I funds. I'm over instruction. So usually if you're a vendor who's trying to come into the building, the principal, if they do look at the information, my principal would definitely say, hey, Dr. Boyce, this is something I got in my email. Take a look. Do you think we need it? They usually ask two questions. Can we afford it? Do we need it? And mm -hmm. those are the things that the gatekeeper really is the assistant principal. If there's academic coaches in the building or if you're a program like probably if it's a, related to like the graduation rate or PBIS or student discipline, student motivation, it may be the guidance counselor, the head guidance counselor. Those individuals are really the ones you want to be approaching because if they put their stamp of approval on a program, on a vendor, on a speaker to come in and work with our young people, usually the principals will be much more likely to receive that recommendation because they're a, pers they're a person who they trust who's in a position of influence. Mm. All right, coach, this is the last question. And I know you about to go in on this one. Okay. How can curriculum change your life as a speaker, as it entails with the school districts? So that's really where the money is, right? Speaking is, that's a low ticket item. You know, probably the most established speakers who have a long pedigree may be able to command up to 10 grand to do a big colloquium for a district, but there's, that's, not, that's not constant money, all right? You may be able to do some kind of PD sessions. And sometimes when it goes well, other schools want to bring you in and you get repeat business, but that's not where the money is. The money is in curriculum, and I want to be specific about what I mean by that. The money is in print-based curriculum right now. You would think in the digital age that everybody wants something that's digital, but you would be amazed that we still, most a lot of teachers want kids to write in a physical book. And there's two, there's two benefits to that. One, most of those physical books, they are purchased off the line item called supplies. It's where most of the money is is placed in a school's budget. And so it helps them to be able to, it's like a slush fund, I call it. That's mm -hmm. where vis-a-vis -vis markers and paper and um, post-it notes and all the rest of that is in that. But also workbooks that are considered to be consumables, which is workbooks that have to be purchased every year because students write in them. That's where the money is. That's where you can charge $12.99 to $14 or $15.99 a book. And every one that they buy goes towards that pot and because you do such a great job, next year, we wrote in those books, we got to buy a whole other set again, all right? If you try to make a digital curriculum, it changes the line item that funds, the, that funds what you're trying to sell. And because of that, it now starts to shift over into computer software. It's something that has, sometimes has to be approved by uh, the network administrator, especially if there's a license or other things that goes along with your curriculum, and you really can get into the weeds, it can slow up your funding, and you may not make as much money as you think you're going to make as if, as if you offered a print-based curriculum. Some districts want the option of print versus a, a digital curriculum, and if you're really gonna create one, I would recommend you do both, because you never know which one school district is gonna want, but don't discount the power of the printed page still in 2022. Mm. Woo, that's it, y'all. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. So, Coach, last two questions. Number one, where can they find you if they want to work with you? 
Let them know. All right, so that, that's a great question. So two things. One, I have a new book that I teach all these principles. It's called Cracking the Code. You probably can't see it in the background, but it's on my website. It's called Cracking the Code, the Blueprint for Entrepreneurs to Secure High-Paying Contracts with Schools. You can visit me on my website at www.jcbedpro.com. Again, www.jcbedpro.com. You can follow me on Instagram at jcbedpro. You also can follow me on Twitter with the same handle. And I'm also, also, I'm also on LinkedIn. It's by my name, uh, Dr. Joel C. Boyce. Um, and I'm getting them on LinkedIn. I'm constantly putting out information. Outside of my book, I also do offer VIP coaching where I can work with you on your product to help you to be able to modify what you already have. A lot of speakers just want to get some additional game about how can I make this more marketable? How can I target schools better? But then there's some people who want done for you services where they want me to actually create their curriculum for them. They want to give me the vision and I develop it for them in tandem with them, with their feedback. And we create a prog program that works for them. I also offer that service as well. And all you have to do is reach out to me uh, You can, and I will work out a package for you to make that work. So, and uh, lastly, I also offer a course where I actually teach you 10 different elements that you need to know as you are trying to break into a school district. You can actually take the course on your own and get the game and create your product the way you want to. All of that is available on my website, again, at www.jcbedpro. I love to work with you. Man, listen, let me say this to y'all. That's my coach. <laughs> uh, right. And, um, I'm going to say this to y'all. If you're listening to this right now, um, he has literally changed my life. When I came to coach, I was a good speaker. I kind of understood things, but he literally sat down and broke the game down to me and explained to me the exact language that I need to speak. Not what I want to speak, right. what they need to hear. Right. And so literally because of that, he's putting me and my family in a better position. He is the truth. He is the GOAT. And I promise you, a lot of you that's watching right now, you already know how I am. I operate in integrity and character. This man right here, if you're willing to bet on yourself and invest yourself, he will change your life. And so I just wanted to put that out there. Like, I don't know what you're charging now, but <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just glad that I was able to rock with him and learn the information and become a better businessman. Because yes, sir. Appreciate that. So, um, Coach, last thing, man. Um, let's just say there's some new speakers out there. You know, they're struggling, right? They feel down and out because they're not seeing the results that they want to see. Um, we call this last moment, you know, your ingredient to your sauce. Like, what would be an ingredient that you would leave um, for those individuals? Uh, this is a long game that you're playing. This is not a short-term game. You know, don't be sucked in by what you see on Instagram, where you see people making all this money doing whatever they're doing, you don't know the struggle that they went through to get to where they are. You got to understand, even when you're trying to get school contracts, we're talking about when I teach is about, I want you to be working right now for a contract for next year. You're playing a different game than other people are playing. But when you land the contracts, when you do a great job, we love to invest with entrepreneurs year after year after year, we want to call them the same people. We know we're going to get, we know how you're going to interact with our faculty and, your, and our staff. And so if you think about your investment in yourself as a long-term investment, you don't just try to, I need to make, you know, I need to make $10,000 on this contract. That's not the way we work, right? Mm -hmm. you, may have, you may have multiple smaller contracts that are more lucrative than one large contract. But again, once you do a good job with us, principles are the best advertisement that you can get because they will tell other principals, they will tell other leaders, especially when their data improves, when their student behavior improves, when their staff is happier, they wanna know what are you doing? And the first thing they're gonna do is explain, hey, I brought so-and-so in, he worked with my staff, he did an amazing job. So I want you to think long-term, don't be discouraged. And when you don't know something, reach out to people like me to help you. We are in the school, we understand what we're looking for. We have the firsthand other side of the coin knowledge to help you get where you want to be. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Hey, bars. And so that is it. Thank you all for tuning in and watching and also listening. We appreciate you. This is the Secret Sauce Podcast, the ingredients of the underdogs. Be great because you are great. Let's get it. Let's grow. Let's be great. Yes, sir.